Pastor Monica. Wow, what a privilege. How you guys doing? Hey. Doing great. Uh, you know, I, I'm overwhelmed. This is the first time I'm going to share the word in English in an American church. So it's always time for the first time, right? So uh, I got to share with you guys that uh, I received a call from my interpreter 15 minutes ago. He said, I'm not coming. So got you do it by yourself. So if uh, you have the gift of tongues, you might have to use it this morning. Huh? <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to read a lot of Bible today. So I want you to get ready with your uh, Bible, your pad, your phone. Because we're going to get straight to the point. You know, I learned some time ago that in 15 minutes, a preacher preaches less than he knows. In 30 minutes, he preaches about what he knows. After 45 minutes, he's preaching more than he knows. And right after an hour, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So <laughs> let's get into it. This is Pastor Ralph. He, he, he was teaching us all, all these shows, you know. So God bless you, Pastor Ralph, uh, Pastor Monica, Pastor Joanne. Thank you so much for the opportunity. So the title of the message I'm sharing with you guys today is The King Commanded to Call You. The story I'm going to share is a tragedy. It's a very sad story, but it's not one of those sad stories without a happy ending. It is a story of a forgotten handicapped man and a king who had an intrigue. King David had a great friend named Jonathan, the son of King Saul. If you all remember King Saul, he was the first king, the first anointed king of Israel, but his heart was twisted. Somehow his, his heart became evil. And, uh, you know, David, on the other hand, he was so popular right after killing Goliath in, in that battle the heart of Israel got really close to David and everybody won him, you know, so much. They, they love David. So King Saul had a son named Jonathan. You remember Jonathan? Yeah. So Jonathan was very close friend of David. They were pals. They were like this. And uh, the Bible says that they were so close that they made a covenant of honor and love. And in fact, we can go straight to this, this scripture right here. We can read about this. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 to 16. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. This is Jonathan speaking. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. So basically what Jonathan did is, I'm going to love you for life. I'm going to take care of you for life. And I want you to do the same for me. So David did the same. They make a covenant of honor. Amen? So sometime after, tragedy hits the royal family. King Saul and Jonathan die in battle and on the same day. And that covenant of honor is broken because one of the parts is gone. Tragic, right? So we can read this uh, in Second Samuel chapter four, verse four. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephi Boshet. That's a crazy name to say, Mephi Boshet. Okay, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul. And Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, 
she dropped him and he became crippled. So she was afraid. You know what happened when the royal king, uh, when the, 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 the family, the king and the prince are dead, the enemies were ready to take the palace. So she was afraid that David will do what normally all the enemies, what they do, they kill the hairs to the throne to get, to get it. So she was afraid of that something might happen to Mephi Boshet. He was the prince. He was the heir to the throne, and she wanted to protect him, but this is uh, so sad. She, she ran away with him, and there's something on the floor, maybe a log, maybe a stone, and she dropped on, uh, she, you know, she stumbles, and the kid falls, and he breaks his legs. And uh, it's so sad, right? So if you look for real tragedy, this is worse than the beginning of the Lion King. <laughs> or maybe Hachi, or maybe the Green Mile. I don't know. Probably the three of them. So terrible. So some years passed, and one morning, King David woke up remembering his friend Jonathan. He got the intrigue. He, that night, he, he didn't sleep well. He got a dream. Maybe he had a dream with Jonathan. He remembered, I, I miss my friend Jonathan. I wish he's here today. I, 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 want to, I want to be close to him one more time. And he remembered the covenant. That day he remembered his covenant because he made a covenant for life. But he remembered that covenant. And we're going to stay here for a little while. Second Samuel chapter 9. I promise you we're going to stay in this chapter, okay? So open your Bible here and leave it open because we're going to read a lot here. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 and 4. Say, one day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So he summoned a man named Ziva. And we say Ziva, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziva? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziva replied. The king then asked him, Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziva replied, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodebar, Siva told them. So I was doing some homework about Lodebar, about, about what this place means. So Lodebar in Hebrew is a split word. Lo means no. Debar means worth. Okay? So a place where it's no worth no record, only silence and forgetfulness. The Debar normally means word or thing. The prefix lo is negative, so the term lo Debar will mean no word or no thing. The name may or may not have been an apparent description of the town. If it was a description, it may have been a desert lacking good pastors, or may have been an insignificant place. Nothing town in plain English in the middle of nowhere. So in few words, Nothingville, a place where the trail of the blessings given by God have been lost. So the context in the Bible is very impressive because it's giving us the description where the child was taken. We can say this place is terrible, right? So my first word this morning is for people who are in a place similar, in Lodebar, without the word. And not necessarily without the Bible. I mean without the promises, without the ability to reach everything that the Lord has promised to you. Unable to live and experience what God has promised, and they live in spiritual silence. 
So, if you feel like you are in a place like this, my word, my first word this morning is for you. These are people who have lost their happiness. They have lost the joy of the Lord. They are unable to achieve the dreams that they had in their youth. They have their hearts broken by different circumstances. So, like Mephibosheth, you know, this is a terrible place to be. And the enemy is trying to keep you there as long as he can. But in the name of Jesus, we're going to declare that today is the end of it. Amen? Amen. Today is the end of it. Hallelujah. So Mephibosheth didn't go there because the devil dragged him into it, nor because he was born in Lodabar. If you remember, he was born in the palace. He was a prince. The boy we talk about was born in a palace, a prince of royal blood, the grandson of a king. Royal blood as King David. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, a warrior of Israel. So it all started on that terrible day, the palace. Mephibosheth was just a child. A messenger runs into the palace, gives the news of the tragedy that King Saul and Jonathan both died in battle. At that time, the nurse, the nanny, who took care of him, afraid that his life is in danger, wraps him in blankets to get him out. Then in the run, with a very bad fortune, she stumbles and the boy falls from her hands. In the fall, the child breaks his legs, being crippled for life. You know, remember that during that time, the science was good enough or advanced enough to, to fix the, this child, and she was trying to hide. She can expose the kid because if they find it, they might, they might kill him. So he had to live with these legs like that the rest of his life. So listen to this. This is very tragic. On the same day, this day, the, this, this child lost his father, his grandfather, his legs, and his destiny. And without asking for it or being guilty of anything, he is taken from the palace to a place of silence. So Mephibosheth is now in a place of oblivion because someone dropped him. So my second word this morning is for people who feel that they were dropped by someone else. I'm going to dig deep here because there are lots of cases like this. As pastors, we hear many stories about all forms, all forms of abuse, betrayals in marriage, family, friendships, and also a previous bad experience with another church. Yes, it happens. So we can give free reign to our memory, and if you are not healed from that wound, you can see and feel that it's all there. So maybe I can give so many examples, you know, uh, a, a husband cheating on her wife, a good friend that you have a deal to, make, to have business together, and you guys have signed a contract and someone, you know, did whatever he wanted, run away with your money or whatever. You know, I can go and give a lot of examples. So someone dropped you. Someone was the cause of your sadness today, your, your indignation. So let me tell you this. Uh, you can't stay there for a long time more anymore. You, if, you, if this is your case, you, you can stay there because it's going to eat your life. You got to let go. You got to forgive, let go. And, and ask the Lord, ask the Lord to restore your life. And he will do it. He will do it because you, you can hold a grudge for a long time. It's going to eat you alive. It's going to eat you alive. So these people, what they do, they spend a lot, much time cursing the nanny who dropped them. But they no longer remember how their, their life was like before. Amen? So today, I have good news for you. Listen. No matter how terrible the pain or disappointment may be, there's nothing that God cannot heal. Today, the Lord wants to bless you and restore your life with something much better than you have lost. Amen. Amen. 
So don't look for anything in your past anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. God has never forgotten you. I, I want to proclaim this word. If we can put the verse of Isaiah 43, 19. Isaiah, can we declare this? As loud as we can. Okay? Because this is the declaration that will change everything. For I am about to do something new. Come on. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun, says the Lord. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Give him a shout. Hallelujah. He's going to do it. He started already. He said, I'm doing it. I'm working on it. Yes. Hallelujah. That morning, when David woke up and he remembered his covenant with Jonathan, he decided to give mercy and justice. He was ready to act. At the moment he woke up from that, that, that dream or whatever he was doing, he, he felt like, I have to do something about this. So on this morning, God is ready to change your reality. He's telling you this, that, I'm sorry, he's telling you that none of his promises and the covenants he made with you through the blood of Jesus have been forgotten. Are you ready to take those promises? Can you extend your hand in action? I'm going to take these promises back with me. Amen? So the king recalls the covenant and calls Ziva. Can we say Ziva? You remember Siva? We're talking about Siva. So Siva is a type of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Mephibosheth didn't know Siva. But Siva knows Mephibosheth. Siva knows where Mephibosheth was. And Siva was the link between the king and Mephibosheth. So Siva was the breakthrough. What's the connection between the blessing and the person needing the blessing? Amen? So this is, this is what happened here. Siva is a bridge between the two governments. And the one that joins the two seasons, the one who knows the whole story. The Holy Spirit has known everything about you, your suffering, your past. But your future, he knows, and it's going to be even more awesome. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, let's stop in 2 Samuel chapter 9 again, verse 6. What David says. David says, bring me Mephibosheth. I want him here. I want him back to the place where he belongs. So, I can imagine the story going like this. You know, that day, Mephibosheth is in his bed right here. Let's pretend that the bed is here, right? So... There's a lot of noise all around the, the town. The carriages of the king, the men are shouting, looking for Mephibosheth. Where is he? Look for him. Open every, every house. Try to get him out. And the nanny, who at that time was like 140 years old, she came to say, listen, Mephibosheth, the king has sent his men to take you. Let me help you to get out. And he said, forget about it. The last time you did, look what happened to me. <laughs> forget it. So he's lying on the floor. And then Siva comes. Mephi bullshit. I have the order to take you to the palace today with me. And he said, who, who are you? I am Siva. I am the servant of King David. I need to take you out with me. So, is King David looking for dead dogs that right now? He was like this. He was, is he looking for dead dogs? You know, I don't represent any danger to him. So, you can heal me right here. You can point here. Pierce my heart right now. I'm ready. You know, he was, he said, this, this is a joke. I don't expect anything from David. I don't expect, I, I was in this place for years. I don't, they forgot about me. So Siva said, you're wrong. 
the king needs to talk to you. He needs to talk to you. He has sent for you. So, finally, they, they grab him. They put him in a carriage. And they bring him to the palace. And when he enters in the palace, he cannot believe what he sees. Because he was afraid that they might play all the, the good guy thing to take him into the palace and cut his head and put him in a pike. But the first thing that he sees when he enters in the palace is a smiling king with his hands wide open and saying, Mephi Bullshit, I was waiting for you. Welcome. I intend to do good to you. We can, we can, we can read it. Second Samuel chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. This is what David says. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. You remember the covenant that they made time ago? God never forgets. He never forgets. He said, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Can we say amen? This is what happened here. A much better king than David is present here today. His name is Jesus, and he wants to embrace you, restore you, and give you hope. Just like Mephibosheth, when you're no longer expecting anything, then is when God shows up, and he changed your whole reality. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just like Siva did, he's sending, if you're here today for the first time, and this morning you probably didn't want to come to church. But he sent Ziva. The king sent Ziva to tell you, look, you got to come to the church. Because today the Lord is about to change everything in your life. Exact, exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. So, the king who knows everything. He says, I know exactly how you feel today. I didn't choose you for your moral hygiene or your good credit or your university score, but because I remember the promise I gave you. Amen? So this is where the story goes. And uh, I can give more free imagination here. So Mephibosheth is taken to have a royal bath for the first time. You know what I mean? A lot of servants brushing your back. Shh, 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 shh. You know, hot water, soap, everything smelling great. And he's shaved. And, and they dress him with the royal clothing. They use all Armani outfit, you know. And they have very nice perfume. So he's smelling for the first time like he never before, you know. He's smelling great right now. And he's taking to the palace and uh, the table was set. So I need my volunteers, the king has sent to set up the table. You know, the royal table. Are we excited? He's gonna sit in the table, amen? So the table is prepared. They're taking the table, so we're giving some time. But in that table, this is, it's very, this, is, this is great. In that table, all the princes are around. You know, it's Solomon, Amnon, um, Adonai, um, is King Beersheba, all those big names. You remember those guys, right? So they were, so yeah, I need one sitting, in, yeah. So I have Absalom here. And I have Solomon. Can we give him a, a clap? Let's give him a hand. So, so he's sitting between the princes. How are you doing, guys? Great. Right. Uh, and uh, this is, this is the, the, the thing here. Look. Uh, his, his legs are, you know, he isn't, he isn't, he's not able to... to to use his legs, he's crooked, he's crippled. And uh, well, 
the servants are bringing asado, uh, chorizo, empanadas. And <laughs> they start eating like, you know, he's starting good. And yeah, food was great, man. But I don't feel, I don't feel nice. Look at my legs. Oh my goodness. My God. Look, I look like the president of Uruguay showing my. <laughs> and he's not happy. So David is watching the whole thing, you know. He, he's a good king, and his heart is all about people. So, um, he doesn't feel good being sitting in front of the princess. He grew up in a place where there was no royalty there. And you know what? There's a lot of people coming to the church every morning, every Sunday. And uh, they, they are not used to be around the princess to redeem. And they don't feel like, I don't belong here. So, Mephibosheth, you know, he was feeling like that. So, there's a lot of Mephibosheths outside. And when they come from across those doors, they, they are expecting something like this, you know, to sit at the table, being accepted, being loved, being comforted, being healed. So, we got to be ready for them. Amen? Because they don't, feel, they don't feel like they belong here, but we have to make them feel like they belong to the house. Because that's the whole purpose of the gospel, amen? amen. Can we give him a clap? Can we give him a hand? Yeah. There's a lot of people like that, you know? So, they finished eating, they were like, wow, that's great, but I don't feel like, just feel like I don't belong here. And... David, David asked him, what's wrong with you? And Mephibosheth says, uh, I'm a cripple. And I don't like him to see me like this. I don't like to, the princess to look, look me like this. And he said, don't be ashamed of your wounds. Don't be ashamed of your wounds. Because somehow David knew that someday... A much better king, even being able to show a glorified body, will show his hands, his piercing hands with the holes, because that's the greatest proof of love for you and me. And he's not ashamed of showing his hands pierced. So if he's not ashamed of showing those hands pierced, why we should be. Don't be ashamed of your wounds, because the Lord... The Lord will take you out from that and he will use that to make you stronger. Amen. As a testimony to the world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, the king does something unpredictable there. He say, bring the tablecloth. Really quick. Really quick. That's awesome. I, li I like this kind of people. I wish the world is always like that. You know what I mean? Instant. What happened now? <laughs> Nobody can see anything. Right? That's the tablecloth of grace. That's the tablecloth of grace. You know what grace does? Every imperfection... Every mistake, every wound, any crooked legs are covered by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter how, look, how ugly it was or how ugly it looks, he's covered by the blood of Jesus. This is what the, the grace does. I have a lot of mistakes, guys. I have a lot of mistakes, but you know, the grace made me look anointed, made me look perfect in the eyes of God. It made me look redeemed. It made me look like I'm ready for great things. Amen? And that is exactly what happened with all of us when we understand this, when we accept that we need His grace. So this morning, I want you guys to accept this 
as the most wonderful covenant. You know, when I start reading about the, the covenant between Saul and Jonathan, I will go to the most excellent covenant of all. Thank you, guys. With, with, give me a hand. They, yeah. Thank you, guys. So, the most wonderful covenant and the most perfect covenant of all is the one that Jesus did with us through his blood. Because the Father now, he, he don't look at our mistakes. He uses the filter of the blood. So he's seen us through the blood of Jesus. Amen? He's seen us through the blood of Jesus and everything is new. Everything is perfect now. Amen? Everything is great because he made it perfect through the blood of the Lamb. And today, if you feel like this message somehow was for you, in, if, if, you're the, if you're here for the first time, I will, I will invite the church to stand again. We're going to worship, but I will make an open invitation to you. If, you. if you need breakthrough in your life, if you need a restoration, I want to invite you to come. We're going to pray for you. We're going to leave this altar open here for all the people who need restoration. If you need a breakthrough in your life, if you need something that the Lord needs to do, if you are dealing with some kind of disease or any kind of pain, come forward. We're going to pray for you. God bless you guys. We're going to, we're going to sing. We're going to worship the Lord. You know, if you have never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, we're going to pray a powerful prayer because that is the first step into stepping into the victory that God has for your life. So we're going to pray this prayer together, wherever you are. Let's just pray this prayer together. Because the word says when we believe it in our heart and declare it with our words, it's done. So let's invite him into our heart. So let's pray together. I'm just going to ask everyone to repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the mighty words spoken today. And today, Lord, I ask you into my heart. I ask you into my life. And I thank you, Lord, that I can declare you as my Lord and Savior. I thank you that as of today, I'm a new creation with you in my life. Give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, can we give a, pl a shout out, a push out, a applause to everyone that prayed that for the first time. You know, we're excited. We want to celebrate with you. And if you took that step today, we are excited to be a part of that journey with you. So I encourage you, if you took that step for the first time, there is a text that you can um, send us. It's, you can text the word BELIEVE to 941-999-3383.